it's almost an unfair advantage we have at Marvel Studios because we've got all of the comics and the best comic artists in the world have worked on our, on our comics. So we have amazing inspiration to, to start from. We also have the best artists working in film today here on staff at Marvel Studios that work from production to production and, and led by Ryan Minard. One of the most exciting things about Captain America was trying to find that balance of, you know, period to heighten Marvel to try and find a way to make Cap feel real and that he would have existed back in the day. Ryan Meiderding is very good about going back to the old books and pulling reference and standing next to costume designers and saying, this is, this is where I started from. There's thinking behind here. This strap isn't here just because it looks cool. This strap is here because this is where this would go and this connects to this. And once you come at it from a practical place like that, everything else falls into place. The original costume for Captain America has been classic. There have been attempts to redesign that costume over the years and nothing has ever been as wonderful wonderful and as classic as the original. It's a real tough design to beat. It's, it's, it's almost perfect. The classic Captain America costume, the one that has been in the comics for, for so long, is a brilliant rendition of a costume. And the fact that it has survived since the 40s without significant change says something about it. I think every artist who sort of leaves their mark on Captain America over the past few decades understands that there's sort of essential ingredients of the costume. The color motif for one, the, you know, the stars and stripes for another. I really feel like the stuff to be gained is look at the research and revel in it and find iconic key moments that, that really make him who he is. One of the biggest problems that we'll have as concept artists is that we're working in sort of a vacuum of how do we make this guy look as great as possible? And that doesn't necessarily take into consideration the real actor's body type. It becomes a difficult challenge, and I think that a lot of the stuff that we try to do is just make a really amazing looking costume. Initially, when Captain America becomes Captain America, he's not released to go off and fight right away. He's used kind of as a propaganda tool. He's in this very silly Captain America costume, you know, it's tights. When you sit down and really step back and look at the Cap costume in the comic books, it's not a real practical costume to try to do. Like, the two things that people always allude to are these bell-bottom pirate boots, which were there for years, and the wings that are on the cowl. And they're not, they don't work. <laughs> One of the things that, that that suit was particularly interesting for the Marvel guys was to try and actually get a full-on version of Captain America on screen. The treatment of incorporating the original comic costume into the entertainment USO of it all into the movie, it's a respectful nod to what was designed in the comic books, but also put it in a very realistic place. And then the evolution of what that costume becomes in the movie and how it works in a practical application for someone who's fighting in an action adventure, it works really well. They did a great transformation, but it evolved kind of through the movie. When we get to the final suit, you do have the stripes, you do have the red, white, and blue, but there are, you know, subtle modulations to try and make it feel real, and that USO suit is basically an unadulterated version of Captain America's. You can't have him really step out of the pages of the comic book onto the screen. You have to interpret the visual palette that you've got from the comic book, put it on the screen. Then there's the Bucky Rescue outfit. He has some of the uniform on. He has the shirt with the star. He has the pants, but he uses borrows a leather jacket. He borrows a helmet. He takes a gun. And when he comes back after freeing all of these men that have been imprisoned by Hydra, and he's hailed a hero, it's decided, you know, this costume, it's not only me they were clapping for. They're clapping for the costume. And that is the connection between his stage costume and what later happens to be his cap costume. And he has some design ideas for the costume, which he gives to Howard Stark, and Howard Stark then implements it and you, you, what you see is the coolest costume. The decision to keep the colors perhaps slightly cooler than, than on stage is his because he sees how much it's valued by other people. So we didn't just want to give him cool tech for the sake of giving him cool tech. We wanted him to want it and own it for emotional reasons, for character reasons. I think it's timeless. Even though it's set in the period, it could be used even today. That cap costume, producers didn't want to have anything obviously out of Fortis, not connected to reality of Fortis. The suit's actually made out of mostly nylon. There is some canvas in there, but it's it's made out of stuff that the military would make straps. We were trying to get more of like a Kevlar weave sort of feel to it, so it would feel like a, an actual battle suit. big point about the suit is that it's come from a world of workwear and it's come from a world of battle dress and that it really should be as functional as possible. It's a combination of superhero costumes and a soldier costume and that I think was the 
challenge to achieve that and also constructing these costumes because they have to move. They have to be costumes for action hero. So finding a way of constructing it so it works on the actor, is comfortable and looks good on the screen is difficult. We're doing illustrations usually trying to figure out the look of the character up front and a lot of the functionality stuff comes you know, when they actually can do prototyping and, and figure out you know, what does Captain America actually have to do on screen. Chris has been very aware of what he needs to get out of the suit and the minute he was in anything that was like a finished suit, literally jumped around and moved as much as he could and naturally quite rightly concerned about the range of his movement. That went through a lot of different stages. Obviously there's a lot of people involved and making the suit who worked very hard on it and I would just kind of come in every couple weeks and try a new outfit on and they would poke and prod and measure and cut and I kind of stay out of it and, and then finally they got it where they wanted it. This is the best version? Absolutely. First time putting it on you just think this is kind of cool. I'm Captain America, this is fantastic. The helmet design actually, when we first saw it on him, actually worked better than, than I had expected that it would. And he's got such a great jawline that it worked out great. His helmet is based on the flying helmet. So you can see the leather around his face. The straps are really like paratroopers' helmet stripes. We started with a sculpt based obviously on Chris's head. And then that sculpt was taken and it was flipped digitally on a computer to, to cause perfect symmetry. Because in fact, he's got quite an open eye area which Chris likes and I think everyone's liked in the development because it allows a lot of expression. Uh, it's like designing eyewear or anything else. In some ways, the helmet is best created bespoke on the human face, which is far from symmetrical, but you would end up with such an open eye area, it would look very asymmetric. So we flipped it on the computer. It's a urethane casting. The color of the helmet's actually built into the urethane. There's some finishes and processes. We're just trying to sort of fine tune each helmet to Chris, because I can assure you there's straps and there's donuts of foam and stuff on the inside of that, keeping it in place. It's it's an emblem for the whole way that the suit's been developed in that sort of low-tech, high-tech way. If Captain America's an icon, then the shield is the icon of the icon. Much like the outfit, it's not an obvious weapon. It dawns on him like, I don't need a gun. This thing is amazing. Obviously, aside from just being a symbolic weapon, that he's there to metaphorically shield us from harm and the bad guys, the shield also became a, a very cool weapon for Captain America, especially when they went from the triangular shape to the more round shape. A triangle is not a very practical thing to use as an offensive weapon. And the comics realized that they went to the circular shield because you could throw it and be like a frisbee and come back, and they show that evolution through the movie. Making it circular gave them the opportunity to really do things visually with it, to bounce it off walls, to throw it around, to have it returned to him, and in a comic, this is all important, the visual aspect of it. 600 issues into the Cap comics, he still is able to do things with the shield you've never seen before. And it is always the challenge of our movies to bring that two-dimensional image to life in a three-dimensional film. One of the things that tried to bring to the design was some sense of realism. We wanted to try and bring some depth and give the camera something to play with with reflections and, and really cool battle damage. <laughs> The uh, shield's made of vibranium, which is stronger than steel, but uh, three quarters of the weight, which makes it very good in battle. It's a metal which absorbs all energy. It makes a bullet feel like a cotton ball. What do you think? I think it works. Believe it or not, for, for just a circular shield, we had six different sizes. We had different depths. We went through various metal spinnings to try and get the correct shape. We had to get this so it, it hugged Chris's body so that it actually fitted his arms. They have so many different shields in this film. We have the heavy shields for the shots where I need to block myself or it's going to be a close-up and it's this nice, shiny metallic. We have rubber shield when I'm actually knocking someone out with it and I actually got to hit somebody. We've had a couple shields that are magnetic for when I got to slip it on my back. And then we'll use no shield at all every now and then. Every now and then we'll have to do a shot where I have to throw it and those just CGI it. The toughest thing about the shield was making it believable that this guy could throw this thing, have it bounce off something and take some guy out and have it come back to him. We tried some practical stuff where he's throwing a rubber shield. Nothing worked until we handed it over to Chris Evans, basically, until we said, OK, you've got this shield that's this wide and it weighs this much. What would you do? How would you throw it? And he came up with some really interesting ways of doing it, he, and he had nothing in his hands. He's just miming the action. It was basically Chris Evans' ability to mime 
throwing and catching that shield that made it work. It's very underrated, that kind of stuff, because if an actor doesn't get it right, there's nothing that we can do to make it work. You know, we can only work with what the actor gives us, and he's great. He just performs every time. I mean, always making sure not to make it look like a frisbee, not to make it look like a boomerang, but always giving it sort of a special arc so that it moves in a particular way. It bounces off of things. The last element is the sound guy comes there and he puts the sound that the shield makes, even when you're holding it, because it's vibranium and it, it has this ring to it. Once you put that in there, and it, when it bounces off something, it makes that sound. It's totally real. And it's inexplicably cool. I don't mm -hmm. know why. Like, literally, there's no reason this big round thing should be excellent looking, but every time that Chris Evans walks by it with his arm, I just want <laughs> We're trying to do something that is right for the story and right for the character, and hopefully that, that comes through. You're the only superhero in the world. Mr. Stark, you become part of a bigger universe. You just don't know. I am Iron Man. Sir, we found it. WW2, they initiated a sub-program for biotech force enhancement. Super soldier. Yes. Sir. Take us to the next grid point. But there's no trace of wreckage. Just keep looking. Legend tells us one thing, history another. But every now and then, we find something that belongs to both. here to talk to you about the Avenger Initiative. This is it. This is day one. Gentlemen, you're up. <laughs> <laughs>